for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Hey, welcome to your day off. My name is Corey. Of course, it's my best friend, Tony. What's up, buddy? What's going on, brother? Dude, I'm so excited. So where are we at? 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. We're four days away from Pressy Poe and Friends, our fourth annual Pressy Poe and Friends. Oh, man. Uh, dude, I just want to give a quick shout out to Temple and Frederick, oh, Frederick Maryland. Aaron and Frederick Reiser. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, in Frederick, Maryland, which is where the event's going to be held. For they, allowing us to find ourselves in the event space because without you guys, none of this, you know, would be here right now. Dude, you can start making me cry before we even get started. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, yes, a, a heartfelt, like, just thank you. They've been incredible. And like you said, like, I'm going to start to cry. Hold on. Whew. Like, they have made it possible for us to, like fulfill our dreams and not not even fulfill our dreams because i think actually fulfilling dreams is easier than starting your dreams you know so they were able to kind of like they helped us like just start the walk just start the pathway to 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 fulfilling our dreams a thousand percent brother well said and our, and our title sponsor Bameless, we want to just give you a lot of love and thank you so much for uh trusting us and allowing us to, to do what we do and backing us up yeah, yeah, yeah. Babeless, thank you so much. They're bringing in all their artists. And again, they have like, you know, from for for my whatever, it's it, the best artist in the world. I also want to talk about what I'm really excited about is our friend Oliver Zach, who owns Mad Rabbit Tattoo Cream. Um, and what they're doing uh, is they are doing actually an incredible thing for everybody that comes to the show. You're, you can sign up and they're going to fly one person from our show to Los Angeles, put them up for the weekend. And you're going to go to the Mad Rabbit headquarters, which is filled with the best tattoo artist in the world. And you're going to sit down for a thousand dollar tattoo session. And that's that's all uh, Mad Rabbit is covering that entire weekend. Which I'm blown away about. I'm going to beg Oliver Zach that I can go out as a chaperone. Yeah, I know. I was like, so bummed that we can't apply because that's something that uh, I'm going to apply. But if I went, I guess I'm going to have to turn it down because that would look sketchy as heck. Yeah, no, I wouldn't apply. But <laughs> right again, uh, Marlo Beauty. And yes. thank you guys for, again, you know, just believing in what we're doing and what, what we're putting on, about, yeah. you know uh booksy yes yeah. booksy thank you so much booksy they're also gonna they're also doing a big giveaway um you're gonna sign up for it and we, they were really smart because they were like you know we don't want to send we don't want to send the giveaway to the place because then if people are flying in then they got to fly out with it so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna ship it to your house so the winner they're gonna ship uh we have three winners for the weekend but they're gonna ship these uh these gift i see these big like easter baskets with uh now easter just, passed. just like, amazing these, swag with amazing right. swag exactly and and malibu c Malibu C again, the uh, Malibu C. I love a Malibu C, but I also like I'm scared of Malibu C because whenever I need Malibu C, shit's gone wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like like Malibu C is like like uh -oh. or just use Malibu C as a preventive, so so it won't go wrong. <laughs> you know what? Fair enough. But but in my head, like whenever like I'm like reaching for the uh, the Malibu C, that means that you know something's going crazy in my life. Yeah, and then uh, and. Last but not least, who's going to make everybody happy the night of the show is Ruzel because they're sponsoring the bar and yes. giving you the drinks and hors d'oeuvres and, and make sure everybody stays happy and just in the moment. And thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Yes, I'm completely. And Saturday night is, uh, you know, for uh, Ruzel's going to be there. So every time that you have a drink or every time you have an hors d'oeuvre, make sure to raise that glass and, and give them a little uh, give them a little toast. On that okay. note, on that note, on that note, now that we're talking about alcoholism and stuff. So um, 
listen, this is the month of April. Uh, the month of April is mental health month. Um, and we did a podcast last week and we, we touched on this a little bit um, about what it, what it's like to be a, a neurodivergent uh, hairstylist. And, and, and this week or today um, we're, we're, we're talking to our, uh, our new friend, Denise Marshall, and um, she's a psychotherapist, or I actually don't want to give out too much because I want her to kind of like tell us her journey and, and, and how she found this space. But, um, but yeah, you know, I think it's important that we keep having these conversations. Last October, we did a little bit, we did some uh, mental health stuff. Um, and, and the more and more certainly that you're on social and the more and more that you're communicating with the industry as a whole, which we have the, the, the opportunity to do, um, you see that these conversations are really important. Um, and I think that we could do one every week for a year. I'm not yeah. suggesting we're going to do that, but, but I think it's really important because whatever Denise says today, maybe she reaches the one person that, that needed to hear it or the one person that needed to use it. Um, and, and I think that that's really, I think it's really important that we just keep having these conversations. I mean, you hit the nail people. on the head when you said we need to continue to talk about it because so much or so much in the past, I think we've not talked about it. You just mm -hmm. held it in or, or not said, said anything or you didn't, you know what I mean? I think, uh, the more we talk about it, the more that that people can just really kind of see for themselves that, you know, I, I, whether you need help or not, it just, you know, gives you hope. Yeah, for sure. Should we get in? Yeah. Miss, my new friend, Miss Denise Marshall, uh, welcome to your day off. Hello. It is. It is my day off, actually, kind of. So I'm so happy to be here. And I love that you both are talking about mental health awareness and bringing that to light. And also, you mentioned something at the end about, you know, kind of in jest, joking about alcoholism. Um, I'm also an advanced alcohol and drug counselor. So uh, that is also something near and dear to my heart. But so I'll give you just a quick little uh, background on myself. So I um, actually, from the age of seven, knew I wanted to be a hairstylist. So I have nearly 30 years of salon experience. I started, I went to cosmetology school while I was in high school. I knew I wanted to go to college and that would be the only way I could pay for it. When I graduated from college, I realized I was making more money than my professors. So I thought, you know, I'm having fun and, and doing all of that. So I actually stayed in the industry for a very long time. I've been a manager for the Aveda Institute. I've been an educator for Paul Mitchell. I've been a color educator for L'Oreal. I have been an independent stylist. I've been a commission stylist. I actually lived in the Middle East for 10 years where I also did hair. So this career has served me so well. And what I kind of realized is I later, you know, I did get my undergrad in psychology and, and criminology. And then I later went to get my master's in clinical mental health counseling. And I've been, I do have a private practice now that I work with um, uh, addiction, trauma, and OCD. And what I started realizing in my clinical practice, well, let me back up a little bit. I knew from also in cosmetology school that someday after I got a lot of experience that I wanted to do something to kind of give back to the salon industry. And what I noticed is so many stylists leave this field so early and they don't realize all the potential. And I think a lot of it, what the kind of light bulb moment for me was, when people were coming in in my clinical practice and I was hearing some of the same issues that I was hearing back in the salon and with my coworkers and the things that they were dealing with and kind of started putting the pieces of the puzzle together of how I can come back now and support hairstylists and salon professionals, massage therapists, nail technicians. The thing is, there's so much absorption of emotion in the field or absorbing. I don't know if that's the right word, but regardless, when you look at hair stylists, salon professionals, most stylists are extremely empathic people by nature and with empathy. So empathy, the difference between sympathy and empathy is sympathy is I can know that your dog died. Therefore you would feel upset, but as an person with empathy, you can actually feel that they're upset. So that's the difference. And most salon professionals, I would say, are kind of empaths by nature. And because of that, not only are you hearing the stories, you're physically absorbing it, you know, physically, emotionally, and in every other way. 
And so I kind of wanted to bring some kind of education to definitely still support those close salon relationships that are expected. You know, people come to hair stylists and they view it as their own therapy. And so there's an expectation within the salon industry, barbering, all of that, that field where that is the expectation for a lot of people to come in and kind of dump on the hairstylist, which they feel great when they leave. <laughs> but sometimes the hairstylist feels like they're leaving with all of this emotion and, and all of this baggage really. And I think that's a big reason why a lot of people leave this, this industry. So that's kind of where my angle came from. And I'm really excited to be back in the salon world. I've missed it tremendously. I've been out for, um, I've had my practice for, I've been out for about 13 years, uh, of, of that field. So I, I did start very young if you're doing the math of my age, but regardless, um, I just wanted to bring that back to you. So I don't know if you have any questions about any of that. Well, a, 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 a couple of things. And one, yeah. like, like we've had these conversations, we talked about it before. We've had these conversations, um, before of like trauma dumping, you know, like when our, when our, when our, um, when our, our clients come in and they, and they dump, uh, you know, their traumas on us. And, you know, I, I, I feel a little bit like a sociopath because like, I'm, I'm, I, I, I thought I was empathetic to them and I, and I kind of understand what they're going through. Maybe, maybe uh, to your point, maybe I'm more sympathetic to it, but I don't really feel like I take it home with me. Like I don't like, I'm able to kind of like shut that off and not like shut it off. Like I don't need it anymore. It just doesn't affect me into my next. Cause you are, you are a sociopath. <laughs> cold hearted. Probably it sounds yeah. like it. Let me just get out my DSM. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, but, you know, and I don't, and again, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know what it is. I mean, like I, I'm very sympathetic in the moment and in what you're going to going through. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I don't take it home with me. I, I, I just, I, I, I kind of leave it there. So, but that doesn't mean that people don't, and that's what the conversation is about. Right. Um, w with that. And, and th that's tough. I could see how this could be a really tough job, um, for people. I mean, luckily for us too, and maybe it's again, where we are in our careers, but, you know, we don't, we, we might have the conversation, you know, once a day, but more likely once a week. Yeah. But to that point though, you, but you do have clients that when you see them on your book, that it, it weighs heavy on you because you know, maybe the conversation or maybe the negative uh, connotations of the conversation that's about to happen. That's, that is so valid and so fair, you know, like, like maybe I don't leave with it, but I know it's coming. So there's the stress of that. Right. Well, that's the, yeah, the sense, that sense of dread. So kind of what's happening is uh, another interesting thing that happened to me when I was in cosmetology school. Now I was 17 years old, so there's no reason why I should have felt exhausted. Right. And when I first went on the floor, I would leave feeling like I had run a marathon and I didn't realize what was going on. So there were two things going on. One was I needed to develop this new kind of social muscle of interacting with people all day, but it was also the physical exchange of the energy exchange of physically touching someone all day. And that's a real thing. I don't know if people realize that it took me a year. I didn't find this out until, you know, 20 years later, what was actually going on. So there is an energy exchange with people when they come in and they're kind of like you said, you have that dread. You see that this person's coming in, you know, they're going to not only trauma dump, but a, toy, a term that I, I think I've coined, I don't know if I have that drama dumping as well. So you get all of it from, from them. And then subsequently what uh, sometimes happens is the hairstylist or salon professional also drama dumps on the client. So I actually did a pretty big poll and found out the number one reason why a person doesn't go back to a stylist is not because of pricing, although that was kind of lower on the list, um, very low actually, it wasn't because of skill or technique. It was because the stylist was oversharing with the client. And so one of the things that I kind of help support salon professionals with is learning how to build your life in a way that you don't need to rely so much on your salon environment, which is where we spend the majority of our time, but you're not relying on that for your social support, your emotional support, and all the rest of it. And, and with doing that, that's when you start, we do a lot of exercises in 
uh, you know, I, I teach a course and stuff, but we do a lot of exercises where we look at how well-rounded is your life so that you don't have to feel like you've got to rely on that person. And you also aren't so invested in their life because you're full in other ways. And maybe that's why, Corey, for you, that it doesn't drain you so much. Maybe your life is well-balanced enough that you're not getting, letting yourself get sucked in as much. That could be one of the, uh, the reasons why you're kind of insulated from that. Uh, so it's looking at that. The other thing is getting really regulated. I see so much stuff on social media about firing your clients that aren't ideal for you. And I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And I think there's certainly times when, of course, you do need to put up a hard, rigid boundary and say, no, I can't uh, you know, deal with this type of person. And that's okay. But I think when you're really well, well regulated yourself, you don't have that need to fire clients because you're not as impacted as much by their words and actions. So it's kind of really looking at all of that. And, you know, I know when I very first started this program, I was getting a little a lot of questioning about, you know, are you trying to get hairstylists to not be a place of sharing and connecting anymore? And certainly that's not my mission. My mission is more about how can I teach you to connect in a way that still protects yourself so that you don't leave this fantastic industry. Um, and the ways to do that are doing all those things of looking at your life and doing some of the exercises of how are you living and what is my social support and am I allowing, am I relying too much on them and are they relying too much on me? So you can certainly have conversations where you can shift away and redirect and you can talk about more benign topics when it's getting too heavy for you. That's something that I think is really important. So then maybe you don't feel like you need to find your clients. Because if you look at you know, the general population, it's something like, um, well, this is a whole nother topic. I've talked about introverts, extroverts, and ambiverts, different personality types. And when you look at people who are ambiverts, which is a combination of introversion and extroversion, they're pretty um, direct and outspoken. And those are sometimes the people that we want to fire, but those are actually the majority of the population identified as ambiverts, so it's like 67% or something. So if you want to look at firing that many people, I just don't know if that supports your business the way it could be. So it's just getting yourself really grounded in your life. Uh, one of the things we do, I don't want to give away too much, but is, you know, looking at, you know, if you were to draw out your life in a pie chart and how many sections of your pie do you have? Do you just have work and your family and that's it? I mean, not that that's, that, that really is the, the bulk of most of our lives, right? But you've got to have many, many, many other pieces of the pie. You know, we saw a lot of this in the pandemic when the salons were shut down and people were, you know, 80% of their pie chart was filled with the salon life. And then they didn't really have any other pieces of the pie to fall on. And so that's when it comes really imbalanced and people get that over it's so to speak. And with that, the, self, the absorption of the people's problems. And I'm wondering now when I'm really putting all the pe your pieces of your puzzle together, Corey, how you're not affected. And I'm guessing that you are pretty full in your life in other ways. Well, so now, yeah. well, well here, here's something that you brought up that, that kind of, I had a little light bulb moment with is that it, and it's, I'm going back to two conversations a little bit, but but it's not the relationship with the person, but it's your relationship with the conversation that you're having with the people. Yes. Know? And, 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 you know, for, I think this is a good analogy. Let me know if it's a terrible analogy, but, um, but I stopped watching any news because I wasn't mature enough to, to receive it and then to let it go, you know? So, so because I wasn't mature enough to do it and because like watching the news cycle ruined my whole day that I go, you know what? you know, call it like head in the sand, 
but I also know that 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 certainly the election cycle is four years long every four years, which means that that equates to the rest of my life. And I don't have enough years left in my life to where I can worry about that 24 hours a day. So I've kind of I've had to have the conversation with with myself, like I'm not mature enough to do this. So I'm just going to let this go and let, you know, the, the world kind of do that. So it, it's about having the relationship with the conversation more than it is with the person and like your own relationship or your own, you know, relationship with that conversation. And I think it's really important that, that we look at what our relationships are and what that, what our relationships and not with people, but with like being and what those relationships are and, and how much of a, how much of a drag that is. I um, mean, as far as the pie chart, here's my two cents about this. I know I'm dictating. I mean, I'm taking over the conversation, but with oh, the pie chart, but with the pie chart, like I've always contended that you need a lot of pieces in your pie chart because you're going to find purpose on the, you, you need to experience a lot of life before, before you find your purpose, or you need to experience a lot of life before you find purpose. And I think that if you're not, if you're not doing a lot in your life, then, then you may, you, you may live your whole life with, without any kind of purpose. Oh, that's a really, really good analogy. I mean, a good observation. I think you're right. It's also, um, you know, looking at, you know, when you think about, I don't know, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you may have heard of it. Um, you know, he's a famous psychologist and he did a lot of research around what makes people happy. And really you can't evolve to your point to those higher levels of need until your basic needs are met. And then you're, you know, you, there's a whole, uh, I think there's eight categories or five categories that encompass a lot of different things, but you've got to work through those and you can't work through those to your point without having a lot of different diverse experiences. Um, and you also, you sort of kind of struck a nerve, not struck a nerve, but brought something up with me. I actually stopped listening to these. I shouldn't admit this and I should take a, a page out of your book that uh, yeah, maybe I'm not mature enough, but I stopped listening to the news. Uh, I think when I was about 19, uh, a long time ago and have actually didn't have cable, still don't have cable for you know, decades. And the reason why was I heard a story that was so devastating to me that it really ruined my whole day. I remember I cried in the salon a, a good majority of the day. And I just thought, I can't, I mean, not that I never listened to it. I, you know, I pick up the main points, but I can't get sucked into it, absorbed to it because it just, it, it just wrecked me. I, I just, I can't. She can't watch the news because then she dumps her trauma on other yeah. people. Yes, I, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah so, I, I, I think it's... What I'm doing now. <laughs> you know yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think a lot of people make that their life. You know what I mean? And that, and, and hairdressing is a part of my life, but it's not my life. You know what I mean? I can go to work. I can do uh, the task, and I'm thankful, and I'm blessed that I'm good at it. I have a great clientele. I have a full clientele, but like Corey, I, it stays there. I don't take it home. My life is home. My life is friends. My life is so much more outside of the hair industry, even though it's a part of my life. It's not my life. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, you bring up a good point about this idea of I don't know if you use this word, but people getting kind of what there's a song that says you can become addicted to a certain kind of sadness. There, there's the lyrics of that song and people do. It is addictive. And you get addicted to the drama of it and the excitement of it. And yes, yeah, so look, I, I was very bad at this when I was early in my career. I, I loved it. I loved, you know, hearing all the stories. And then I was realizing, gosh, this is starting to take its toll on me. Um, there's actually an interesting thing about talking about empathy and compassion. Um, so compassion fatigue is a term that a lot of, uh, you know, is pretty popular in the salon world, or sorry, in the, well, probably the salon world too, but in the therapy world. And it kind of became really to the forefront after 9-11 actually. So after 9-11, um, they were using therapy dogs to, you know, go in and console people where people were, gathering, you know, that were grieving people or looking for people and all of that. And because there was such a need, they were having them work several, several, like eight or 10 hours, whatever it was. And after they were off their shift, they found a lot of those dogs, we were becoming really physically ill. 
They did all the lab work, the x-rays, all that, couldn't find anything wrong. They finally realized it was because they were absorbing so much emotional pain. And after that, they put in guidelines that um, crisis therapy dogs are only allowed to work, I think, for two hours at a time. Uh, I have a, a colleague who is a crisis uh, therapist. She shows up on, you know, kind of really bad scenes. And she was at something... And she said, like clockwork, it was almost like the minute the clock struck, struck 12, the dogs were rotated out and new dogs were brought in after that two hours. So, you know, not to say that we're dogs, but it stands to reason that we are going to absorb people's pain. And with it, and then this is really getting convoluted, but you've got to look at your past. It's amazing that like even the dogs can kind of feel that 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 trauma. Like I would have never in a million years guessed that that the dogs would be like empathetic. I don't know where I'm going, empathetic or sympathetic or or that they would they would actually absorb our energy. You would think they would absorb it and just let it go because you know they they seem to be very much um like uh, uh uh animals of the moment. You know, not necessarily like past. And stuff. But hasn't there been like it's been proven that they can sense if the, if you're sick or if you're not feeling well, there's a certain thing with dogs that they, they can just sense those things. I just, yeah, I guess those things, I guess I just never thought like emotionally, but you know, I mean, if you have a dog, you understand that they're like emotional beings. I don't know what I'm saying, but that they keep it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, well, what she was saying, she was saying like they you know had a room full of people and the dogs would naturally just go to the people that really needed it the most. She said it was amazing. So I don't know what they're picking up on. If it's, you know, I think there's been speculation that it's like pheromones or uh, stress hormones in your body that they, that they pick up on. You know, certainly there's the dogs that can predict seizures, which is fascinating to me. Have you seen that? It's yeah. So cool. Like they go lay on their owners before they have a seizure. I just think that's amazing. So you know, it, it is, it does stand to reason that we're picking up on that too with, with people. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. So, so, so what, so kind of take me back to like your classes and your conversations or, you know, your workshops, like, like, what are you like, what are you like teaching the professional about, but it sounds like to me too. And let me back up. Like we've had this conversation, like I said, a few times, but it, it, instead of, it seems like you're pointing the fingers to yourself and what can I do to have a more fulfilled life? So these things don't impact my life the most. And certainly in my time on earth, I've had to have that relationship and those conversations. Like for, for all of my twenties and thirties, I was pointing my, the fingers at other people saying like they're responsible for me. But at some point I had to like, you know, look at myself and point the finger to me and go, well, what is, what's my relationship with, with, why is this driving me crazy when it's not really not their responsibility to make me happy? Yeah. So we do a couple of different things. Um, there's, you know, a couple of different avenues. One is, you know, we really look at, uh, you know, boundaries and how do you redirect a conversation when it's becoming too much? How do you do all the things to ensure that you don't have the need to use your the salon as your therapy chair, which um, I will am very guilty of. Certainly in my 20s, I was really, you know, if you probably if you found any of my old clients, they would, you know, tell you it was horrible. And I probably owe them all an apology and a payment, actually. Uh, but regardless, uh, so that's one of the things we look at. And we also look at, you know, just in general relationships and looking we tie we start looking really exploring in your own past each individual person's past and how that's showing up today that might be causing you problems in your day-to-day -day interactions and certainly that translates over to home as well because i think we'd all agree our home life affects our home, work life and our work life affects our home life so when you're really aware and start getting insight into, you know, something happens in the salon that maybe subconsciously, which we start talking about and accessing is, well, is this actually what's happening now? Or does this remind me of something that happened when I was a disempowered kid and had nothing that I was able to do about it? So we really start teasing that out. And that's the thing that I'm, I think most excited about of, uh, getting back into this and 
bringing this information. I mean, certainly it's not like the classes aren't exactly therapy because obviously, you know, that'd be a different session, but it's getting some really good insight in it through a therapeutic lens that's all evidence-based, um, based in psychology and, you know, evidence-based practices that, that I use in my private practice to, to help people start learning more about themselves and how it's impacting their day-to-day -day and how it's impacting their relationships. We need this, like, in every school, in every cosmetology school, you know what I mean? Because we don't learn uh, about what's about to hit you. You know what I mean? So I, I, I love the, the, to be able to have this conversation while you're in school to help equip you and prepare you for, for your journey. Yeah. I mean, I feel like my, for me, my path would have been so much easier had I known this, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, just it's, you know, it's, really imperative and to your point it's right you know you're right that we don't get prepared just like i didn't know why am i so tired at age 17 hmm. from you know standing all day it wasn't from the standing it was from listening to people and touching people and you know giving so much and not knowing what i was giving how to give it or why i was even giving it you know it's um yeah, it's it's a beautiful business, though. I you know, it's it just I mean, I would I would argue, though, that if we had it in hair school, we wouldn't have listened anyways. Well, you, bring, you, bring you know, I mean, that's also that's also part of the uh, the experience of, of, you know, oh, those were wise lessons. I just didn't listen. Right. <laughs> you know? right yeah. what, do they, what do they say? Like uh, your parents get a lot smarter when you have kids. <laughs> you know? yeah, well, that's true that's true you know? although i do think there's more awareness about mental health now so maybe i don't know i, I think is maybe. there more awareness or we're talking about it, I, guess. I mean we're talking about it but but i get the sense that we're talking about it from a like a, a victim's perspective like i am i have this and you know i'm going to share that i have this you know, whatever. And I don't know if it's good, bad. Listen, and like for 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 to sound like the old guy in the room, which you are, um, is like I don't I grew up in a very strict leave it at a door policy. Right. Okay. And I don't necessarily think that that's a policy anymore. I don't think that like, you know, whatever happened in your home life, whatever's happening in your mental health life, whatever happened, leave that at the door and come and do your job. And now it seems like our job is kind of like opening that door and we, we don't leave anything at the door uh, anymore. And like everything is open game to talk about and to discuss without. And again, this is like age perspective without the perspective that if all your clients are bringing it in and you're bringing it in, that's a very, very, very exhausting existence. No, you're right. Also, you uh, bring up a good point about, oh, now I've lost my train of thought, something about um, at the door. kind of this oversharing idea. Uh, oh, I know. So, you, yeah. So here's what happens with that is people... So you tell me something super intimate and then I think, oh, well, then I have to either at least match that or even go deeper. I've got an analogy for this or, or certainly a practice. I, a practice is that if you ever ask me how I'm doing during the day, especially at work, I'm like, I'm awesome. Right. And and, and I choose that because because immediately as as a human being and as a human experience we always like to out trauma yourself or we always out to oh listen i had a bad day well listen your day wasn't bad let me tell you about my day you know what i mean and like and what a drive personal this is just my own pet peeve is like hey tony how you doing oh not bad what does <laughs> bad mean right like i don't even know what that means right and by the way tony doesn't do that i was just using him as a the yeah. I, I feel but, but this, whole, this, this whole this whole idea that we set our life up with a negative perspective, but then expect either a positive result from it, like you're expecting like this, or you expect like society or 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 whoever to then come in and fix your problems when you can't even say I'm having a good day. Oh, that's true. You bring, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're kind of flavoring the menu before you even, you know, eat the meal, basically, right? You're already setting the precedent for how it's going to go. And just thinking about that, too, about this idea that you had said, I don't know if you said this, but it's some, I think you said it earlier about, you know, whether or not you're going to have a great day. 
and how long, I would think you were talking about trauma dumping. How long, how many years, decades, days, weeks, hours, months are you going to spend letting your past story dictate and guide and direct and write the rest of your story? You know, and a lot of it is people don't know what their story is. They don't, they know what happened, maybe consciously or subconsciously, but until you really start looking at that, only then can you re rewrite your, your future or write your future rather. You know, you can't change your, story, you can't, you change your life. Pardon? Change your story, you change your life. And this is, this is something that, again, I talking about my journey a lot and I apologize to everybody, but you know, like for years, I had a lot of resentment and regret to um, my parents, mainly my dad, you know, and it wasn't until I had to change what, you know, here's what I know as a dad, and I think we can agree with this, you know, as, as a father, we're all just doing the best we can. And I have to assume that my father was doing the best that he can. And that, you know, with, with his upbringing, right? Because we always like to blame our parents for our upbringing, but we don't blame our parents for their upbringing. Right. 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 And, and, and the trauma that he grew up with, then I know that he gave it to me one step softer. Right. right. And it might've been hard for me, but he gave it to me one step softer because that's all he, that he knew. You know, yeah. and then and and I'm hopeful yeah. that I gave my kids one step softer, you know, yeah. but then but then you run into the what's the analogy or what's the thought about like weak, uh, strong men create weak times, weak times create strong men, what, whatever that, mm -hmm. that saying is, you know, and, and I think that, you know, it takes a little perspective to kind of see that. However, back to that, like, like my dad raised me one degree softer than what he was raised, you know, and, 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 and what I've been able to do certainly now is to give empathy towards or sympathy, empathy, whatever, towards what his upbringing must have been to, for my upbringing to be what it was. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've done a lot of work on yourself. I can hear from your words, which is great. Um, but you're right. It's it's reframing like you, you know, you kind of said change your story. And I, I think you meant really change your relationship to the story and your understanding of the story. Um, and then you can start, like you said, recognize where were they coming from? I remember years and years ago uh, i went to a therapist actually you know but well most therapists have we have our own therapist so um shout out to mine hello <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, no. so uh, also uh, thank you marianne uh anyway um regardless uh i remember going to a therapist though a long time ago and they were wanted to do this like family tree and I was like, what does it matter what my great uncle did? Like, I, I just, I never went back to the person. Well, what I know now after my training is exactly what you're saying is all of these family things are passed down from generation to generation. So, you know, if you have three generations of alcoholism, not only do you have that genetic predisposition, right? But you also have all that learned behavior to your point that's been passed down, passed down, passed down. So when you start looking at your past, you do have to dig deep and find out what was going on with my grandparents. What was going on, if you can, if you have access to it, what was going on with my great grandparents even? Because that will filter down. We also know that there is actually a genetic component. They found this out through um, the Holocaust survivors, second generation had generational trauma um, that was showing up, you know, all of these things are passed down, learn, you know, early memories that are, you know, we're kind of born with, like, you know, these people that are prodigies that, you know, know how to play the piano at, you know, age two, where did that come from? So there, we're all connected in this really, you know, familial way that um, even if you didn't grow up with your biological family, there will be some genetic predispositioning behaviorally also. That's a, that, 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 that's such a deep thought to kind of think about. Um, you know, I, I was uh, to, to, you know, again, nail the, nail the head of whatever. I'm going to mess it up. Um, mm. But, you know, like you never think about your, you only think of your parents as your parents, but you never think of them as innocent children. 
Right. And you never think of them as like what what trauma that they must have gone through or what they went through as children, which then dictated the behavior for which they um, for which they're the adult. Um, but I also think that that can't be an excuse for me. It has to be just a commitment to 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 let the buck stop with you. And 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 to be honest, that that's my life mont- motto. But it's even like, back to what you said in the very beginning about, you know, I mean, when you said all. Oh, you use me as the example about, you know, Tony, how are you? I'm like, oh, not so great or yeah, yeah. not bad. You know, we are responsible for the words we speak, you know. So when I walk into the, the shop um, and Sierra, uh, our front desk manager, she, uh, you know, she says, Tony, I love when you come in because we I walk in. She holds her fists out. We fist bump. She goes, how you doing? And every morning I say blessed. And it's great. She doesn't necessarily maybe hear that all day or hear that anytime during the day, but that I know that one moment it she's looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm speaking as anybody, even my clients, you know, Tony, how are you? I'm blessed. You know what I mean? Whether I'm having a bad day or not in the big scheme of things, I'm blessed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I carry that, that with me all the time. And, uh, and, it, and you do, you impact people around you with your words do you want to impact yourself with your words yeah 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 definitely yeah i mean you what did you say when you uh said uh oh my day's okay <laughs> whatever but you're right you're setting not bad time. not bad not bad yeah. or i could be better not bad not bad it could be better it could be worse. Better. Yeah, exactly. Like that's, yeah. And that that's why I always enter, I, I always answer with like awesome or great because I don't even know how often people hear that, you know, and they might think I'm full of S or whatever, but that's okay too. You know why? Because right. sometimes that conversation is for me, you know, um, you know, so well, uh, our brains don't know, right? Like they don't know the difference if what it, we, it does, whatever we tell it to, you know, if we tell it we're having a bad day, you know, we can have a bad day. Yeah, for sure. For, well, you're telling yourself to have a bad day when it's not bad. Or you're telling yourself to have a not bad day. You know, I don't know what is not bad. I don't even know what not bad is. You know what I mean? Like, I guess it's a double negative. It could be, I don't know, whatever. It, it's too crazy. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that, that we've talked about a few times on the podcast, um, certainly I'm guilty of talking about it, is that um, I'm a big believer that change isn't what's next. Change is getting rid of a belief system. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. It, it's, it's, and it's coming, I think you kind of alluded to this of coming, getting at peace with the way things happened. You know, um, you know, I have, I, I don't want to, you know, disclose too much. Well, it's no secret. I, I got into the psychology field from a tr- pretty significant trauma history. And, um, you know, which is kind of what I wanted to learn, like why people do what they do. And, the changing the relationship with that is what now, you know, I used to feel like, oh, why did this happen? Poor me, this was awful. And it was awful. But now, believe it or not, I'm actually in a small percentage of me is happy in some way that if it was going to happen, that it happened to me. And the reason why is because I've been able to do something really good with it. And I've sat with so many people hearing their trauma for the, you know, they've told, I've, I've worked with people in their forties and fifties that tell me stuff for the first time that they've carried their whole life because they feel, you know, safe to do so. And, and so I feel like, yeah, I wish it wouldn't have happened, but I, in a way, I'm glad that, like I said, it, I, that it did so that I can get to do what I do. Um, that's amazing. Happy. Yeah, it is reframing your, History. I mean, that's a bit of a stretch there, you know, like, but it's true. Like people, you know, I work with addiction a lot. And the number one thing that helps people work through addiction, not the number one thing, but one of the big things to sustain uh, abstinence is when you're able to give back and help someone else through their journey. And when you have purpose and you're able to find a reason for, you know, a beautiful thing that can come out of a very horrible thing that happened, you know, with the, we see a lot with addiction and families falling apart and, and everything that comes with that. Uh, as a side note, sorry, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent, so you feel free to edit it out. But, you know, there's a, a lot of posts that I see about, um, you know, it's something like 
20% of, you know, hairstylists suffer from anxiety. Well, that's really within line with the general population is 20 to 23%, roughly, depending on uh, what study you're looking at. It is, is the same as the general population, but the difference is that not only do hairstylists suffer from anxiety to that in those numbers, but they're also taking on all the other anxiety and everything from their clients. So we see that. We also see there is a, I don't know the numbers here, and this isn't based on research, it's just my own observation. I do think there is a slightly higher rate of addiction in our field. Um, and I think part of that is through the anxiety of, you know, there's a lot of trauma also in our field and, um, you know, that's going off on them. Well, I mean, I think, I think, uh, Robert Cromine says it best, like we're the industry of misfits or we're, we are a industry of misfits. And I think the reason that we are misfits is because uh, a lot of us are, are lost to what like what a traditional education path would look like or what a traditional path would look like you know so i, I think a lot of us like we we end up here as opposed to you know being here if that makes any sense at all i don't know but you know it, it's like I, you know like even just last week in the conversation um she was saying that uh that it certainly in England is like, oh, hairdressing is something that you try out if you have nothing else going on, you know? So, you know, if that's kind of like the basis, you know, if, if that's, right. if that's the way she feels in England, I don't know. I don't know where else going with that, but, but, but I think that is true, right? Like if we are the industry of misfits, we're also, you know, there, there's, I mean, there's never been a salon that I've worked in at where there hasn't been an addiction issue or there hasn't been an addiction, um, not issue, but, but, you know, we've also had a lot of recoveries too, but in order for there to be recoveries, there has to be the addictions in the first. So what advice would you give for someone to be able to handle, uh, or, you know, with the anxiety plus the drama dumping plus the addiction, I mean, like how, what, what, what are some of your advice? Yeah. So the kind of the insulators, if you will, right? Like how do you, um, well, it's going back to the, really what we kind of started the whole conversation with is getting your life really well-rounded and balanced and getting insight into yourself, learning how to regulate yourself, learning about how is your past playing out today? How are your past beliefs, interactions, stories, messaging that you heard? How is that affecting this exact moment in the salon right this minute? You know, you have someone that comes in and, and you know, through some, well, go into another thing, but, you know, we store some people's uh, subconscious body language in our amygdala in the back of the brain, which is the reptilian brain. And how are those, maybe someone comes in and you're not actively registering it, but once you get insight into yourself, you will, is okay, that little body movement subconsciously reminded me of something that, you know, a caretaker did that was challenging for me. And I'm putting myself back in that exact feeling. Now I'm reacting to that client this way. So it's really getting insight and and getting grounded and balanced in your life like those are really kind of the three takeaways i would say do you help um hairdressers or people in the industry uh to achieve that or to to be aware of that yeah so that's what we do in um one of the courses is looking at we really spend some time reflecting that, you know, I can't go too deep, obviously, because it's not, you know, I'm not going to open up a trauma wound in the middle of a, you know, training session, but we look at past messaging, particularly around um, interactions with relationships that could have been challenging and how that could be playing out now. How is it affecting you in real time, both at home and in and your, your professional life? And then also looking at, um, ways to interact differently so that you support your kind of your bottom line really at all all these pieces of the puzzle all to go together they're not separate you know separate one is impacted by the other it impacts all the others as well so yes we do go uh i spend a lot of time on that actually have you um i know earlier you mentioned a little i i'm probably putting words in your mouth but the way that i understood you you mentioned a little bit of like uh inner child work and like you know who are we you know who, who is this inner child and um uh, again i'm going to speak for you but whatever uh so i know that and this this is the god's honest truth is i did more healing in an hour of breath work than i ever could 
do when it comes to like inner child work. Um, and I know you had a similar experience. There was more healing in an hour of breath work than uh, again, a decade uh, of wondering what if, you know, it, it's, it's, I am such a big proponent of like breath work or, or these different modalities that, that frankly, when I was in my twenties, I, I would have been a gobbledygook, you know, right. Uh, do you, Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you're up. I, I, I stepped on you. No, no, no. Uh, no, you're actually right. So you're definitely right because, um, so I don't know if you've heard, so there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score and that's by Bessel van der Kolk. I actually have the book right here somewhere. Yeah, here. I, if I, if I touch it, it's all going to fall apart. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I actually uh, did some training with him and this, it goes into exactly what you're saying is all of these memories are stored in our bodies on a cellular level and it affects not only our health but the way we feel every single minute of the day and that's why like i know i've been in yoga classes before where i will just start crying for no reason and it's all that cellular messaging that's been stored in our body that you're releasing through breath work or through movement um, because we know, you know, we're learning more and more psychology so early in its development in the overall scheme of things when you look at compared to physical medicine, but we're learning that they are really all connected and doctors are finally coming on board too, to understand that the majority is particularly with D GI issues, a good percentage of them are actually more um you know psychologically related not that it's in what someone's mind and they're making it up but their their emotions are affecting their physical well-being so 95 percent of the serotonin that we produce is produced in our gut so that stands to reason when you get you know that sick feeling of being nervous it really is a sick feeling that you're having uh, you know, so it's all tied together. I mean, I could go on for like literally the whole day about some of this, but, um, and that's why the breath work works basically is, you know, it's accessing all of those earlier messaging that we when we sat down to do the breath work, they, the, the uh, facilitators were saying, listen, some people are going to laugh. Some people are going to cry. Some people are going to, and I'm like, and not being resistant to it at all, but I was like, ah, I'm not going to cry. Denise, I woke up an hour later and my face was soaking wet. And it wasn't like an emotional release, but like it was just like tears everywhere. That was like, it was so crazy. It was just, uh, I'd never kind of experienced like uh, emotionless tears, but it was definitely some kind of like major release that was going on. So do you, were you having like conscious memories at the time as well, or it was just like a physical release? I think, I think a lot of the, uh, uh, yes, everything, you know, um, you know, we, d I think we did it for an hour. The other thing about like breath work is like, there's no time, right? Like we could have been there for 10 hours and, you know, you just don't register time when, when you're, it's almost hypnotic, you know? Um, yeah. It sounds like you're in a very deep meditative state. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 and and it it was amazing, you know. Um, highly, highly recommend anyone, um, to ch at least try breath work, but you gotta let go. So if you're not ready to let go, workshop? like where did you do it? That sounds cool. So yeah, so um, uh, do you know uh, Elizabeth Fay? She does the hair love retreat. Okay. So the hair love retreat. So uh, we've been um we've been honored enough to be invited twice to uh, to hair love retreat, and uh, and she does breath work in her practice, and she shares her breath work with her. She actually she certifies some um some breath work uh, instructors. As, I want to do that. <laughs> it's one of those things like I want to like be a, like a breath work instructor, but I don't know if I'd ever do anything with it. But I just kind of want to do it to know it. I don't I don't even know why. You know, you know what I mean? This is cool and it works. <laughs> yes, because it was, it's so, and I've only done it a couple of times, you know, it's not like I'm not, I'm, I haven't done this a thousand, you know, I don't have my thousand hours in the air with it, but, but just <laughs> how impactful it was just a couple hours or the few hours that, that, that have put into it. It's, it's just, it's so game changing. Not that I want to make this all about breath work, but it was just so impactful for me. Oh, I think that's awesome. Did you do it too, Tony? Oh Yeah. Yeah, I, I had the same experience. I mean, I didn't cry. I laughed, but it was like that little kid laugh. Like, you know, I was able to reconnect with that little guy. And it was it was just, yeah, it was incredible. It really was. Uh, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think 
I might be lying. I'm gonna. I said I might. I might be. I'm gonna be honest, but I might actually be lying. But I think a lot of my, um, a lot of my uh, story changing for my dad happened during that breath work. Well, it's, so that's what I was wondering. Were you like consciously thinking about it, or it was just a release? I just. I think when you do really, really strong inner child work, you can't help but empathize with with with, with everybody's inner child. Yeah. Whether that's your parent, whether that's your spouse, whether that's your kid. Now, usually when it's our kid, we have our ego connected to their inner child, right? Because we take some kind of responsibility on how they were raised for good or for bad or for whatever. And those are actually more difficult for me than than my my parents' inner child, if that makes any sense at all. I don't know. But right. I, this well, is a bit like therapy here. Right, yeah. It's <laughs> getting, deep. it's getting deep over here. <laughs> but yeah yeah awesome. Denise, how can like um how can people get a hold of you how can they find you how can they find out what programs you're doing and 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 all that give us the goods yeah so um my program i so the, i i named the program under the cut so what's going on underneath that haircut that well, but anyway um it, it's funny because i figure people will pay it's funny people will pay for their hair before they'll pay for therapy. They'll pay for what they can see, but they don't want to pay for what they can't see. It's very interesting, but regardless, you don't see like fast real-time results. But um, so it's called Under the Cut. So I'm on Instagram. I would love it if people would follow me because I'm just in the infancy of building this actually. Um, it's under dot the dot cut on Instagram. And my website is underthecut.org. I do have a class coming up April 15th. It's a virtual training. Awesome. I believe it's Boundaries 101 uh, is what we'll be teaching. And that's where we'll go into learning about not only what a boundary is, but how to instill one and why it might be hard for you. And then looking at those whys, really, so that you can kind of work through that so that you can start putting up some boundaries. We don't just talk about, you know, getting your nails done and getting a massage. We go a lot deeper into what I think my definition of a boundary really is. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And Denise, where is that class? It'll be virtual. Um, so I do virtual trainings. I do in-person trainings. I'll be doing, um, going to Montreal soon to do training. Um, I think maybe, yeah. Anyway, so I, you know, salons can use me to do an in-person all-day training, half-day training. They can do a virtual training. And it's also available on L'Oreal uh, level program. Uh, people can actually use their points to oh. purchase the course for, uh, for the digital, uh, sorry, for the virtual courses. Eventually, it will be a digital download as for, course as well. So it's a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm just like so excited. It's just taken uh, it's taken, I started writing this actually in about 2016. So it's a pretty big curriculum and it's pretty rich. It's tiring, which is we actually had to reduce the time of it because it was just too um, kind of emotionally taxing. Um, you know, obviously I'm not going deep into therapy because, uh, you know, that's uh, would be outside of the scope of that practice. But uh, we were getting you to guide to just kind of scratch the surface so you can start going on, you know, kind of your journey um, in your life to make your business the best it can be, really. Well, that's, then, that's amazing. Yeah, Thank you so that. much for like, uh, uh, you know, grabbing this, uh, this bull by its horns, you know, because it, it's definitely needed. It's definitely it's just it's just needed in the industry and not even in the industry i think it's just needed in society and and you know bravo for 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 attacking this and bravo for putting something together for um you know for 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 our community we we applaud you and we thank you for that and miss denise marshall thank you very very much hey, for um, happy i met you both oh, absolutely. Friends, so to speak. same same and thank you for joining us on your day off thanks have a great day
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.